Good evening, everyone. The hour being 7 p.m. on Monday, June 28th, 2021. I'd like to call to order the uh, Laconia City Council meeting. Just to go through a couple of um, administrative items here, this meeting is held in person and noticed uh, in uh, and the meeting room has been noticed in conformance with RSA 91A, a quorum of the board's members must be physically present in the meeting room for the meeting to start. We have a quorum. The public has the opportunity to attend personally or participate by, in a participate personally or by Zoom. Um, if something occurs that disables access to Zoom, the meeting will continue regardless and members of the public or board members using Zoom will have no recourse. So I encourage anybody using Zoom right now, if they're concerned about it, to hurry on down to City Hall. Trains getting ready to leave the station. Um, Choosing to use Zoom is done at the individual's risk. Using Zoom requires the use of an enabled device to participate on Zoom. Your webinar ID is 845-5163-5655. The password is 452-522. To listen only, call 1312-626-6799. We also have an opportunity to view this meeting at the YouTube under City of Laconia, www youtube.com forward slash Laconia NH. So uh, before we go any farther, I would ask Councillor Cheney if he would be so kind as to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilor Cheney. <clears throat> we are joined uh, this evening uh, at Council table by our recording secretary, Cheryl Hebert, City Manager, Scott Myers, and Finance Director uh, and handling the IT is Glenn Smith. Uh, before we go any farther, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councillor Cheney. Here. Councillor Susie. Here. Councillor Littman. Here. Councillor Haynes. Here. Councillor Hamill. Present. Councillor Felch. Here. Mayor Hosmer. Here. <laughs> That's six to one, Councillor Hamill. Yeah, let's let's let make this a habit yeah, tonight, okay? Up. All right, gotcha. <laughs> Usually Councillor Littman. But anyway, it's nice to be back together <laughs> once again, everybody. And it's nice to have all of you here as well. So before we go any farther, um, I would like to just um, a number six, which is the council proclamation, which we don't really have a proclamation right now, but um, I would ask if uh, Joel Foliard is here. Please come on up. As all of you can see uh, to the left of the council and to your right in the audience, we have four uh, classic uh, posters from uh, here in the city. And um, you know, the city manager's office was first contacted back in early May of this year by Mr. Foliard to see if the city was interested in his generous donation of several posters from the Colonial Theater. Uh, Mr. Foliard is now living in Merrimack. Uh, he grew up in Moultonboro. He has fond memories, like so many people do, of the Colonial Theater. Um, it was the first place he ever went to see a movie. Very true. We won't ask the year, but if you want to share that, that'd be really great. <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. I was five years old. All right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Foliard purchased the posters uh, advertising the Colonial Theater shows from 1935 to 1939 at a sale in Moulton about seven years ago. Uh, some were in need of restoration. So Joel brought them to Photosmith Imaging in Dover, uh, where they were restored to their original condition. So welcome and thank you. Uh, these, uh, when I first saw them uh, in uh, in Scott's office, um, or my office, actually, I, I was just, it's amazing to look at that. I think it is really generous of you to not only donate them to the Colonial Theater, but you also your keen eye to pick these out years ago and realize um, they would be of value to the city. So thank you. My pleasure. I really was. Thank you. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit about this. And uh, yeah. um, uh, as you said, I found them, I bought them at a sale up in Moultonboro. And I have to tell you is that they actually brought these back so they look brand new, especially the green printed one, which in the copy that I have is entirely covered with red crayon. Ah. And in the very lower corner, there's a piece of paper that eventually got that glue, got glued on it somehow. 
and they did a terrific job. And I just wanted to try to do what I could to try to help with the reopening of the Colonial because, you know, I got interviewed by the Laconia Daily Sun. And as I said there, that this is the beginning of a change for Laconia for a reinvention, which is really great, especially downtown. Well, uh, thank you. This was, um, you know, uh, this has been a, um, a labor of love for so many in this city. And uh, speaking about the Colonial Theater without the previous mayor, Ed Engler here is, is kind of odd because this is something that he pushed when it looked like it just wasn't gonna come together, he kept pushing. So, um, you know, I'm sure if he were with us and maybe has a chance to look at these on YouTube, um, at some point he'd be really blown away by them as well. But, you know, it takes a community to do this. And, and the condition you found those posters in was probably the condition that most of us found the, the, the theater in as well before the work started. So there's something sort of you know, beautiful about the Renaissance of the theater and, and something like this is just a perfect fit. So uh, your generosity is greatly appreciated. And um, certainly we look forward to perhaps having you back when these are hung and unveiled. Um, if you would like to do that, we'd love to have you. Thank you. I appreciate it a great deal. Absolutely. Any, any comments from fellow counselors? Councilor Hamill. Yes, uh, Joel, thank you so much for, for doing this. You don't know what it means uh, to the city and to the theater. Um, Nancy called me when you made the, the offer and uh, said, there's a gentleman that has original posters for the Colonial and he wants to donate them. And I, I told her, I says, call him right back. <laughs> says, uh, we definitely want them. And uh, thank you for your investment and all that. And we really appreciate it. Oh, I'm happy to. I'm, anything that helps, is, that's what matters. Terrific. Anything else from the council? No. So thank you again. Really appreciate it. And he's welcome to stay around for the rest of the meeting, right, Mr. Mayor? <laughs> Things are going to get exciting, Joel. So I hope you have your popcorn and drink because it's going to get rolling in a minute here. All right. So moving right along to item number seven, which is acceptance of minutes from the previous meetings. Um, I, uh, we had the budget meeting of June 14th, 2021. Minutes of the meeting were distributed to the city council on Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. With no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk, the minutes will be accepted as distributed. Regular meeting minutes of June 14th, 2021. The meeting minutes were distributed to the City Council on Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. With no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk, the minutes will be accepted as distributed. <clears throat> With the budget meeting minutes of June 21st, uh, the minutes of the meeting were distributed to the City Council on Wednesday, June 23rd. With no corrections or changes submitted to the clerk, the minutes will be accepted as distributed. What are we going to do when we're not getting together every Monday? Huh? Think about all that time we're going to have on our schedule right now. Bob, you're looking at me like I'm uh, Councillor Susie, like I'm crazy. You've got you've plenty of plans. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to miss you. Okay. <laughs> you going somewhere? <laughs> all right. Uh, moving on to number 10, we're under interviews. Uh, Robert Ames seeking reappointment as a regular member of the Weir's TIF. What's that? You skip number nine. I always skip number nine. <laughs> Thank you. Number nine, citizens' comments for matters not on the agenda. So if anybody has anything they'd like to speak to the council about, uh, to get us up to speed or have some feedback, and it's not on tonight's agenda, now would be the appropriate time. If you'd introduce yourself, that Thank would you. be just yeah. terrific. Scott McWilliam, uh, 61 Pearl Street. I think it's Ward 4. Perfect. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank all, all of you and countless others who aren't present for taking the initiative to save the Colonial Theater and seeing that project to its completion. I know there were challenges along the way. Uh, myself, like a lot of others, I watched the progress from Main Street outside, and I think uh, one of the counselors kept us updated with some photographs uh, along the way. And I had an opportunity a few weeks ago to see the inside firsthand, and I was awestruck. I mean, the restoration they did was just beautiful. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's going to be a, a source of civic pride for many years to come. So I wanted to thank all of you and, again, all those who aren't present for seeing that project uh, through. And I look forward to 
going to a show there, I think in September or October, I have tickets for. So, um, number two, uh, I saw recently in one of the local papers that uh, a nearby town, I think it was Moultonboro, had installed uh, banners in their downtown area. I thought that might be a nice idea for uh, the city of Laconia to consider. A lot of times these banners highlight different things in the city, such as the Colonial and other and the mill and other things that could be highlighted. You know, we have those historic uh, sort of light poles around the downtown area that have a single light on them. And I think some banners uh, hanging off of those would really, you know, help uh, again in this um, revitalization that we hope uh, will come uh, as a result of the Colonial Project and, and others. Um, third, I, I saw, I think it was last Friday, the governor uh, signed a budget bill. And within that, I believe there was a provision to allow the state to sell the state property that's within the boundaries of the city of Laconia. I don't know how all these things work, but uh, I know there was an initiative to create an authority of some sort or a commission that I don't know where that stands. The last I heard it, it, it didn't get anywhere, but my point is I would hope the city would continue to have a voice in how that property is, you know, whatever the future sale, uh, future use of that property. I would hope the state would recognize that the city is an important stakeholder and how that property is ultimately utilized. And again, I don't know exactly how that process works, but I would hope that our state representatives along with counselors uh, working in tandem would uh, ensure that we have that voice uh, when it comes time for the state to uh, act on that on that property. Thank you very much, Mr. McWilliams. I think you raise a number of good Thank points you. here. And certainly, uh, again, I think of former Mayor Engler and the work that he's done in Spearheaded, but I also look at the other folks in the council here who were very strong advocates and supporters, in particular Councillor Hamill, who was our clerk of the works, so to speak, and always there and kept an eye on everything. So it's really a great team effort. I think um, Councillor Hamill and I uh, have planned to take a do a downtown walk and to spot some areas that we think could use a little polishing up to make the downtown look a little better. I think the idea of um, banners is, is a terrific idea. And just as an aside and an update on the Lakeshore Redevelopment uh, Commission, uh, they, they've done an awful lot of good work over the uh, past few years in enhancing the value of the property and delineating some wetlands and looking into the remediation process for some of the buildings as well as the real estate. Um, they've done remarkable work to enhance its value and I hope it certainly comes to fruition. Um, so thanks, thanks very much. Council Cheney. Could I just add to that? I, I attended the meeting today um, the legislature appropriated 300,000 each year. Thank you. <laughs> that used to be Councillor Bounds. I know. You would take care of him. I'm yeah. sitting, sitting here thinking, well, I <laughs> what I'm thinking. Uh, in any case, the uh, the legislature has appropriated 300,000 for the Lakeshore Redevelopment Planning Commission for the next biennium and carried forward in the budget any funds from the previous biennium to the next biennium. So funding for the council is still there. The question becomes what, you know, what happens at this point? They are, today, they were discussing uh, uh, initiating contracts uh, going forward, one with Lakes Region Planning Commission through the December 31st of this year. I forget what the other one was. Uh, Dean might remember, I, I don't guess it's all that important, but they were uh, negotiating contracts still. So they haven't gotten the word apparently. That's, well, that's good. I think that's good news from my, from my perspective. I and I, I, you know, as the, the, that's a transformational piece of property up there. Well, I, I, and, and I think that I would, I would say, and, and I know the manager and Dean have both uh, attended regularly. We've watched them try to negotiate or or navigate uh, that property uh, and and have it fulfill a, a several different purposes not not individually but collectively several different uh, purposes on the property and I hope whoever ends up buying that takes some of that work and uh, and and keeps it in the forefront thank you
Thanks, Councilor Cheney. Um, again, anyone else who would like to make comments to, uh, uh, concerning items not on the agenda? That's what I wanted to say. Welcome, Mr. Matos. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, my name is Stacy Tomatos. Might want to lower the mic just a hair there. That's it. <laughs> I own Weir's Beach Convenience and Gifts located at 1198 Weir's Boulevard. I am here to strongly encourage you, along with the Parks and Recs Department, and revisit the new rules to Weir's Beach. What transpired this weekend needs to be addressed. Um, the new, new rule of no grilling, if there is not enough receptacles to put your coals, I am asking, please, let's get buckets. Let's educate the visitors that are coming here to visit. They're here to visit the beach. They stay for hours. They're not here to take their families into restaurants with their soaking wet children. They're here to be together. They want to be here. The, um, the other thing is the garbage. I understand there is a lot of garbage. I know there is one dumpster. Can we add a second for a few weeks? The visitors that come, we all know are Hispanic. They don't speak English, a lot of them. Yesterday, they were told at about noontime that they could no longer have floats in the lake. And after visiting my store and purchasing many floats, I now have people coming to return them because they were all told to get out of the water and put them into their vehicles. So now I have people wanting to return what they just purchased from my store. Um, I also had a visitor from the Pox and Rex department, Matt, who wanted to come in and talk to somebody in charge and discuss the new rules with me. I don't go to the beach. I don't need to know the rules. But he would like to say that he would like me to tell people that they cannot have alcohol on the beach. I sell alcohol, yes. What they do with it after their purchase is their business. I am not going to have myself or my staff let people know they're not going to the beach with the alcohol. So I would just, re I, Fourth of July weekend is coming. It's coming in a few days and it's going to be very busy. I highly recommend that the no grilling rule be taken down until it is revisited again in the future. It has a great impact on my business. I am no longer selling grills, propane tanks, lighter fluid, grill lights, lighters, um, paper plates, napkins, cutlery, you name it. Anything that has to do with grilling is in my store. They all forget to bring things. And I have had a hit over the past month and it's affecting my business badly. So please revisit that rule of no grilling. You can control the alcohol, you can control the hookah, you can control the trash and the loud music, but I don't think it's very fair to take away that grilling. So if you would please revisit that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matos. Thank you to you and uh, you and Jose are anchor small businesses in the Weirs and do an awful lot. So thank you. <coughs> Anyone else uh, seeking to make a uh, comment? <coughs> Lurking in the back, in the sneaking back. up to the microphone. You might want to raise the microphone there. Thank you. Thank you. It's hot out too, but I wore this especially for you, Counselor, as always. Um, Welcome, Mr. St. Clair. It's nice to have you. And again, it's nice to see all of you here for two meetings in a row. That's that's good. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, again, which I've done around the city and on air and stuff, thank all of you for all the work you did deciding about Motorcycle Week this year, because I know it wasn't easy 
because I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of you, uh, including the city manager and his staff. Um, as you all know, uh, barring any bad news in the next week, which I don't expect, um, we had a, a, a pretty good rally. And uh, <coughs> most of the people I've spoken to uh, visitor-wise were thrilled to be here. And, um, and the councilors I saw up there and the, and the mayor and the city manager uh, could see for themselves what was going on. Uh, and also the uh, vac vaccine program we had at the uh, tent going on with the Air National Guard went well, very well. And uh, I gave uh, both the visitors and the guardsmen, guard members, uh, a chance to uh, mingle during the rally. And, and that was a good thing. And uh, even uh, Councilor Cheney made a, a trip up there and he's shaking his head. But that was really thrilling because as he will tell you, he hasn't been up there in a long time during Motorcycle Week. So you can talk to him in private about his his thoughts. 31 years. So 31 years, yeah, long time. So I do want to, all kidding aside though, I know the effort you all put into this. Uh, privately, you know, behind the scenes and publicly. And a lot of you took heat from people, uh, not always uh, deserved, but nonetheless, you did take heat from people. And, and I appreciate that, the aggravation you all went through. It was very important. Um, we were able to do this because of the vaccines getting out there. We, we knew back in the winter that was going to be very important. And uh, again, I just want to thank all of you on, on behalf of Jennifer and the board of directors from uh, the association. So thank you. Now, <clears throat> with regards to the last speaker, which I was kind of unprepared for, I would just like to throw in a couple of my two cents about this uh, situation in Weir's Beach. And I feel as a lifelong resident, I, I can speak to this. Uh, I've never understood the rule about floats. Growing up here, both at Opeachy Park and when I was able to go to Weir's Beach, we always had a float, usually a tire tube, but we were able to use them. And I don't understand, uh, I'm sure somebody's come up with some reason why they shouldn't be, but I don't understand it. Um, I just don't understand it. So I, I hope that that is looked at again. And the loud music thing kind of gets me because I don't know who's, uh, whose idea of what's loud or what's not. And, uh, you know, some people probably would rather have a quiet zone. No phones, no music, no nothing. So I hope you take that into consider consideration, too. And as far as uh, people having grills, I know uh, the complaints there from some members, staff members and other people about uh, debris that's left behind. But I would rather hope that the city can, we welcome all of our visitors. Weir's Beach is mainly a tourist area. Most of our residents don't go to Weir's Beach. I say that from just observing, not a, not a uh, survey, so to speak. But most of our residents do go to the smaller beaches around the city because we know where they are. And Weir's Beach is a tourist destination. So no matter who the tourists are, they're coming here as tourists. And I hope that uh, we take, that Parks and Rec and you guys will take that into consideration one more time. I, I think that's very important for the city as the tourist destination we are. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. St. Clair. There's nobody on Zoom. Will you okay, that's great. Thank you. Now we'll move along to item number 10 on our agenda. Um, under interviews. Uh, Robert Ames seeking reappointment as a regular member of the Weir's TIF District Advisory Board to a three-year term expiring at the end of June 2024. Currently, there are two regular members positions up for reappointment. One regular member position, which will become vacant upon the resignation of a member when her term expires at the end of June. <clears throat> Due to a scheduling, con scheduling conflict, Mr. Ames is not able to be interviewed at the Council's June 14th meeting and has respectfully requested the Council consider interviewing him and appointing him at this evening's meeting. We all have... Uh, Mr. Ames application. You want to step up, Mr. Ames? Welcome. And um, perhaps you can just let us know why you'd like to um, why you'd like to be reappointed. Anyway, it's good to see you. I hope you had a good motorcycle week. Good to see you too. Uh, motorcycle week was terrific this year. The, everybody commented on on what a good what a good week it was. Business-wise, weather-wise, in all respects, everybody was happy to, to see it come back. 
and be what it what has always been. Great. So I'm here to be reappointed to the TIF uh, to the TIF board. Um, of course, I I uh, been very active in we in the Weirs in a lot, a lot of various respects. Uh, working with the Weirs Action Committee, working on the Laconia Motorcycle Week board, and as a businessman in the Weirs. And I've always tried to do what I can to help improve the business atmosphere and the residential atmosphere of Weir's Beach. And I think the uh, the TIF board is is a great opportunity to do to do that to to move move things forward for the Weirs in a positive direction. Good. Well, thank you for your willingness to serve uh, and the work that you've done up until now. Any questions um, from councilors of Mr. Ames? Seeing none. Thanks again. Welcome. We will take this up later on in the agenda. Scott, this is there. We, we can yep. interview and do this. Okay, great. Okay, moving along to item number 11 on our agenda, nominations, appointments, and elections. Um, uh, first one up is Joe Driscoll III, seeking reappointment to a regular member position on the Water Commission for a three-year term expiring at the end of June 2024. We're looking for a motion right now to uh, reappoint Joe Driscoll III to a regular me member position on the Water Commission for a three-year term expiring at the end of June 2024. So made by Councillor Susi, seconded by Councillor Felch. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Mr. Dis Driscoll appointing, reappointing Mr. Driscoll, please raise your hand. Six votes in the affirmative. He is reappointed. Item number 11B on our agenda, which is uh, Russ Poirier seeking reappointment as a regular member of the Weir's TIF District Advisory Board to a three-year term expiring at the end of June 2024. We're we'll looking for a motion to reappoint Russ Poirier as a regular member of the Weir's TIF. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Mr. Poirier's reappointment, raise your hand. Six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. Poirier. Uh, moving along to 11C, which is Peter Brunette. We'll be looking for a motion to reappoint Peter Brunette as a regular member of the Lakeport TIF District Advisory Board to a three-year term expiring at the end of June, 2024. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Is there any further discussion on Mr. Brunette? Seeing none, all those in favor of reappointing Mr. Brunette, please raise your hand. Six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Revisiting uh, Mr. Burnett again under 11D, be seeking reappointment and be looking for a motion here to reappoint Peter Burnett as a regular member of the planning board to a three year term expiring at the end of June, 2024. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Is there any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. That's six votes in the affirmative. And Mr. Burnett is reappointed. Under number 11E, um, we have Scott McWilliams seeking appointment as an alternate member of the planning board to a three-year term expiring at the end of June, 2024. I'll be looking for a motion to support that. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the reappointment, please signify by raising your hand. That's six votes in the affirmative. Oh, that's an appointment, not a reappointment. That motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. McWilliam. Appreciate you your willingness to serve. Consideration. Uh, under item number 11F, Councillor Susi will abstain um, from this vote as he has from the interview process as well. But this is uh, in regards to Stacy Susi, who's seeking appointment as a regular member of the planning board. We'll be looking for a motion to move to appoint Stacy Susi as a regular member of the planning board to a three year term expiring at the end of June 2024. So made by Councillor Haynes, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask all those in favor to raise their hand. That's five votes in the affirmative. And Ms. Susi is appointed as a regular member of the planning board. Under item number 11G, uh, the just interviewed Robert Ames. 
be looking for a motion to reappoint Robert Ames as a regular member of the Weir's TIF District Advisory Board to a three-year term expiring at the end of June 2024. So made by Councillor Feltz, seconded so by Councillor. Um, I think we have to waive the rules to do that. Is okay. That right? I think because we put it on the agenda that the request was there, then it's on the agenda. I think you're able to because it was okay. posted a notice, but typically no, we would. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lippman. Any further discussion on the nomination of Robert Ames? Seeing none, I'd ask those in favor of this reappointment to signify by raising their hands. That's six votes in the affirmative. Thanks, Mr. Ames. I think he's already <laughs> left. Okay. I'm gonna open up right now uh, public hearings uh, under 13A. Open up a public hearing for ordinance 2021-235-21.2 relative to expanding the adopted area of the historic overlay district. A notice of this public hearing was made available on June 16, 2021, edition of the Laconia Daily Sun, and posted at Laconia City Hall, Laconia Public Library, the Community Center, and the SAU. <clears throat> Action on this item may be taken up under unfinished business on tonight's agenda. So I'd like to open the public hearing at 7.32 p.m., and if there's anyone present who would like to speak to this uh, item on the agenda, now would be the appropriate time. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Really well. Um, a lot of you know me and some of you, if you don't, um, my name is Ruben Bassett. I own a few businesses here in town um, and I'm also a commercial real estate agent. Um, Every one of the businesses that I own or own part of in Laconia is in a historic building. Um, we enjoy that. We take pride in that. We try to um, add to that. Um, I have a lot of concerns about this type of regulation. Um, while I agree with, I think, the end goal of preservation, um, it concerns me about going about it in this way. I think one of the great ways to go about about this is is you know leading by example, and I think that this council um, has done that with the colonial. I mean, we've preserved a, a beautiful piece that um, wouldn't have happened without the city intervening. So I commend you on that. I think it's it's done well, and I think it's leading by example. But when you put more and more regulation on business and on property owners for what they can do. Um, it's a big concern of mine for what you're going to do for that when it's more and more complicated um, to be able to accomplish those things. And, and while I appreciate the sentiment, I love old buildings. Um, I've, I've sold them. I've in them. I would strongly caution you against, you know, some of this regulation. And it, if it's done, it, it it's taking, you know, giving power to a committee that you're relying on what their view of the historic you know value is of what things should look like of what the, the best and highest use is um, you know we ran into this when we sold the the mill building you know the sellers it was a high priority for them but at the same time you have to trust that you know owners are going to do the right thing and even if they don't is it is it our job to to regulate <coughs> what people can do to that degree with their properties um, so I just want to caution you um, as you look at this um, to think hard about if, is this the way that we go about accomplishing the goal um, of preserving some of these these pieces in town. Um, and so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ruben. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anyone else like to speak to during the public hearing portion of the meeting on this item? Welcome again, Mr. McWilliam. Thank you. Uh, with all due respect to Mr. Bassett and others who have raised concerns, certainly, you know, as they say, the, de uh, the devil is in the details. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of regulations owners would be faced with as far as renovating their buildings, installing new windows, signage. Uh, as far as my understanding, and someone can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the historic district is just designed to help prevent 
the demolition and destruction of historic buildings. I mean, under a different set of circumstances, the colonial could have been sold to a private developer who could do whatever they wanted with it, including tearing it down. Uh, my understanding is this is just a designation to protect these historic buildings from demolition and not to impede on owners' rights to, again, renovate their, their historic buildings and, and the like. So uh, again, I, as far as I understand, it's on the map as just a designated area. It doesn't prevent owners from, again, carrying out those kinds of renovations. It just would prevent demolition, which of course, once it's gone, it's gone forever. So thank you. Thank you. There's nobody on Zoom seeking. Thank you. Hello, Shore. Glad you could join us. How are you all? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Good. Warm day. Warm day. Sometimes I get up here and I feel like I'm just repeating myself, so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that Ruben spoke to. He, he brought up a great point, lead by example, excellent. And your example, of course, also fits into uh, the master plan of Laconia, which I've stated to you before. Uh, you, you do speak to the revitalization and the vision for this city is to assist with the economic development and uh, you do speak to its resources here in the city. Um, and the uh, going with that as well is that the <laughs> is um, the the ordinances as a reminder to everybody is the ordinances weren't made in a closet we didn't vote on those in a closet by ourselves <laughs> the ordinances went through quite almost a full year of discussion through council and um, through those who were putting those ordinances together and there were things taken out and things added to those those ordinances went through all of you gentlemen uh, possibly people who weren't here as well I mean who are not here with us as well, but those ordinances were made basically by you. And to lead by example, then those ordinances are leading by example, your example. So that's the point I'm making, trying to make there is that you all put those ordinances through. We're, we're a committee put together to follow what you have put in place for us. So uh, respectfully to uh, Ruben, they are leading by example, their own example. They put those together and they okayed them and they voted on them. And the people sitting here at this desk are voted on by people in this community. And we put our trust in all of you to make the decisions that you make. And you made those decisions. And as a commission, we then follow those criteria that you have put forward. Um, it's interesting to me that we have so many negative thoughts about a historic district when there is so much information out there about the positives about historic districts. So unfortunately, I seem to think that people just aren't doing uh, their own research. Um, I would hope that they are before making any rash decisions. Um, I'm also interested, it, I find this to be a difficult place to have um, discussion. Obviously it's difficult when I'm trying to just give you all information. There's people back here who have their own thoughts running through their heads and I can't turn and have a conversation with them or answer their questions right off. Um, but I'd be interested to know how many people in the room, how many people in Laconia have lived in a city that has had a historic district. I'd love to know your horror stories because it sounds like there's a million of them. So I'd love to know that. I don't know if anybody's sitting here that has gone through that, but it seems as though many people have had horror stories because that's the only thing I'm hearing is negative, negative, negative. So if you've lived through that yourself, I'd love to know about it. That's how we learn, we share. It was um, concerning to me over the last couple of weeks, our hope was to educate as many people as possible about um, historic districts. Uh, all lives are psychotic these days and um, ours was no different. Um, however, we did 
get a letter to the editor explaining some more about the historic district. We have put an educational slideshow on LRPA and she is, uh, they are running it regularly on uh, video on demand as well. So there's a lot of information out there. There's also a lot on the internet and the two places that I consistently send people to is New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. I would like to remind people finally that there's nothing there's no extra time. We, we've pretty much figured this out last time. There's no extra time truly added on to what a builder or a business owner needs to do um, to, to have changes done to their building. Dean said it takes about 45 days from the time that they throw in their permits to the time that they're usually able to move forward with their plans. Sometimes that gets held up in other, count, in other meetings. Uh, that could certainly happen in a historic district commission meeting as well, but it's basically 45 days and we fit inside that 45 days. So I'm not quite sure where the massive issue is with time and getting their plans completed, but I'd love to know. I've only had one phone call from one community member in the last two weeks asking for more information or clarification on things, but there's 16,000 of us in this city. Uh, I would like to remind people as well, finally, that this commission was not in any way ever um, brought to the council for consideration uh, or, or in any way thought that time would stand still. It is not specifically the preservation of historic buildings. It's the preservation of the character of this city. We walk down Main Street and we see the beauty that there is and the buildings are what make that beautiful. The train station, the United Baptist Church, the um, Congregational Church, the library. If you do a little bit of history on Lakes Region History Online, you will see the older pictures and how much of our city really hasn't changed. It hasn't, and that's amazing because there are so many cities in our country that have literally been <coughs> bulldozed to the ground and changed significantly. And the character of those cities changed when that happened. And yes, urban renewal did all kinds of crazy stuff for us. But I do believe that urban renewal brought us great things and it brought us not so great things. Rotary Park is in place because of urban renewal. If urban renewal didn't happen, it'd be a pile of old buildings possibly still in place. And it's not anymore. It's a beautiful in, inside the city park. So I would hope that you could understand that this commission that you put into place is here to assist with your vision for this city of economic development and prosper for our business leaders and our business owners and our property owners. We're here to work with them, not work against them. Everyone on that commission is dedicated to helping our business owners and our business property owners make better what they already have. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other comments regards to this agenda item? I'm going to hold this because I don't trust it. <laughs> Catherine, to <laughs> Catherine Tokars. Um, Welcome. It's thank nice you. To have you. <laughs> thank you. I'm on uh, the Heritage Commission. I'm not on the Historical District, um, but I would just hope that you would take into consideration what the work that has been done, and do the best you can to preserve Laconia. We have. I have to disagree with Ms. Shore. I would trade Rotary Park for all those buildings down to the corner in a heartbeat. You can have that park in my backyard. I don't care, but I would trade that because I think we really do need this and I strongly urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Welcome, Bree. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bree Neal. I own Polished and Proper Barbershop downtown. Um, as stated a couple weeks ago, 
my stance has not changed when it comes to the subjectivity of the way the ordinance is worded. I can understand how when it applied to four buildings in this city that it may have been something that was positive in your eyes at the time when you passed it. However, I think the animal changes when you apply it to an entire economic sector of the city, which is why I think you should take a very close look at the wording of that ordinance. And any property and business owner who is subject to it, I think has a right to know what measurement they are being compared to before they go in front of a board for approval for anything. And the way that ordinance is written right now, you have no concept of that ahead of time. Phrases like the historic character of Laconia and those types of words are very reassuring and warm and fuzzy. But when it comes to clarity of enforcement, they lack that clarity. Those things do need to be defined for the sake of anyone who has an idea that no one has thought of before to do with an historic building which is why most ordinances have what is yes, what is no, and then the wiggle room for the things you didn't think of. So I hope that moving forward, I have nothing against historic preservation. I think that ideal is a very good thing to have, it continues to move Laconia in the correct direction, but it's how you implement it that matters. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. Hello, oh, counselors. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Melissa McCarthy. I am a business owner in downtown. I own the studio Boutique and Gifts in the um, historic F.W. Woolworth building um, on the corner of Pleasant Street and Main Street in downtown. And I also um, sent you counselors um, an email the other day expressing my concerns about the language of the ordinance. I agree with what Bree said. I'm not against historic preservation and I'm not against careful consideration um, of, of a particular property in any of the city of Laconia. Um, but the, the arbitrary nature of someone on a committee saying, oh, we wanna make this city better. I suspect that my ideas of what makes a place better <laughs> are different than many other people's ideas of what makes a place better. But the idea of a thriving, growing, continually evolving downtown footprint is essential to continuing the growth of the city as a forward-thinking, innovative entity. The Belknap Mill exists because Mr. Morin had an innovative idea at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the city is founded on that. And by honoring the historic tradition of change and innovation, we can honor that history. We've got beautiful posters that show the history of the colonial, and we've got a beautiful renovated theater as, as a beautiful part of downtown now, that, and where everyone is excited about the coming attractions. But if the coming attractions are all about yesterday's news, I don't feel that that's in the best interest of the city. Thank you very much. Thanks, Melissa. Mr. Moriarty, welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councilors. Nice to see you all. Uh, I guess it's probably no secret that I'm opposed to the idea of expanding the historic architecture overlay district. In fact, I'd rather rally in favor of its uh, discontinuation, but that's a conversation for another time. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what my remarks would be here and how to be as succinct as possible, and I'm sorry I came up empty-handed on that. I certainly would be happy to rebut some of the comments that have been made about you know what are the horror stories and uh, I, I guess it's nice to think that right now we are at perhaps one of the best times in the governmental 
private sector relationship. Uh, maybe it began with the mayor's economic development roundtable, sort of set the stage for, what was that a decade ago? It goes fast, doesn't it? Uh, a decade ago, and we're here today, I think maybe because of the beginnings of those conversations, and this is a terrific time. We can have a dialogue. I can call any one of you and you will take my calls and we can banter about any number of things and we can, we can understand where things are and where they've been and what your perspective and my perspective might be. And that is terrific. But over the course of the 11,000 years that we've considered ourselves civilized, you know, depending on whether that's Gobeki Tepele or wherever you want to call the beginning of civilization, it has not always been that way. And I predict that it will not always continue to be that way. So yeah, I have, I have arm lengths of stories about how the intentions of government and the intentions of the private sector are at odds with each other. And I'd be happy to share those experiences with anybody willing to listen. Uh, and I take that experience to this situation when I ponder, you know, the time that I spent with my legal advisors uh, over the last three weeks trying to get a handle on what this means. So that wasn't free. Uh, I replayed every meeting. So there's another, what, six hours of time, uh, time that I would rather do other things, honestly. But I care enough about this to come out and say to you that I think it's unnecessary. I really do. The fact that we had a colonial theater to preserve is because people spent money. I know that's an unpopular thing to say, but the fact, I'll say it again, the fact that we had a colonial theater to preserve is because people cared enough to do the best they could with the money they had to preserve it. I was struck the other day, somebody asked me, it's a question, I, I, I honestly I didn't know the answer to this, but every single construction project I've ever been involved with in my entire life, I didn't clear trees, I didn't clear cut areas, I didn't build a parking lot, I didn't erect a new, I have built zero new buildings. Every single building that I've done, which is quite a few, has been a renovation. And I hear in my own rhetoric when people say, well, what do you do for a living? Well, you know, I, I like to rejuvenate, you know, otherwise depleted properties and bring them back into usefulness. And so I do, I care. I care very much deeply about preservation. I really do. And yet, despite that lifelong pursuit of accomplishing that, I still cannot get my head around the idea of adding extra layers to do what we're already doing well. I said to my wife this morning that I wasn't going to say this, and she encouraged me to say it. I said, Mary, you know, you and I are married. You know, when they expand the historic district again to our house, uh, are we going to have to consult with them about, you know, we can't even agree on what color to paint the exterior of our house. Are we going to have to, you know, have a committee, you know, another seven people in our marriage to figure that out? And she's, she said, John, you, you should say that tonight. So I've said it. Um, I really, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, I, I can't tell you enough how opposed to this I am for my own reasons, but I'm not, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. I would like, however, to leave you with this thought that as best I understand the public comments of the planning board, 100% of the people who spoke in favor of the, of the expansion of the district were people who had a connection. They were either committee members or they had a direct connection to the liaison planning board, what have you. The, in other words, the people who were seeking the authority were the ones speaking in favor of it. And 100% of the people who were speaking in opposition to it were the private sector who didn't, weren't seeking that authority. And to me, perhaps that will give you the conscience you need to say, you know what, maybe we've done enough. We've got 11 buildings in downtown Laconia on the National Register of Historic Places. We've got the buildings that are clearly the, the icons of our city under all kinds of protection now. Maybe because of this approach to who's in favor and who's not, uh, you can you can conscionably say no tonight. So thank you for your consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Moriarty. Hi, Jane. Welcome. Thanks. Mm. <laughs> this has a life of its own. <laughs> I'm uh, Jane Whitehead. I'm an archaeologist, and I have seen how civilizations and cultures rise and fall. But I've also seen how modern cultures regard the earlier phases of their civilizations that have fallen, how they've preserved them and how they've admired them. And countries, cities that have um, 
preserved uh, and glorified and, and uh, made, made central to their identity, their historical past are those that have been the most successful. So some of you um, may remember when Mussolini ripped down most of Rome. Well, most of you won't remember that, but uh, the effort then to put back the center of Rome as a center for tourism has made all the difference in the world. The great cities such as Athens and Florence have done the same thing. Um, so I'm not only, I don't only study antiquity, I am an antiquity myself. I remember uh, Laconia before urban renewal. And I remember how vibrant a place it was, how full, uh, full the stores were, how full the traffic was. Um, and now we have so many em empty storefronts. Basically the bottom line with any historic district is that it it is a financial benefit. It ends up being a financial benefit to the city. It's not about the nitpicking little regulations about paint color. That's not what it's about or the shape of your doorknobs. It's about preserving a character and regarding the value of the past and um, uh, seeing it as part of your own identity as a city. Thank you, Thank you Jane. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry that John left, but maybe he'll catch this. I, uh, I disagree with John strongly that about these people are for it and these people are against it. I've been upset about the lack of preserving historical buildings in this city since I was in high school. I didn't have a business then. I was upset when Hathaway House bit the dust after this planning board was lied to by the developer. And Councillor Hamill knows about that lie because Councillor Hamill and Councillor Baldick, I have a nice photo of them uh, at, at my business downtown now under the glass, uh, breaking dirt for the new Dunkin' Donuts was there. And in the article, uh, you know, it talked about how the new owners were gonna preserve the Hathaway house and do this and do that. But the planning board didn't have it in writing. And the only thing the planning board was able to preserve up there was an oak tree because they have that in writing, nothing else. And I also disagree that the Colonial Theater happened because of a bunch of people, a bunch of businesses and, and, and citizens getting together, clamoring to protect it. That happened because of this council right here, whether you remember back then when it started or not. This council and the mayor and the current mayor are the ones that, said, let's go, let's do it. What happened, what would have happened if it had been a different council? I'm not sure if that had been put to a vote, a binding vote in a city election, if the, if the votes would have been there for the city to spend the money that it has on, on the future of that building with the thoughts of getting it back. I'm not even sure if the votes would have been there to do what this council did to preserve the property over there on Church Street. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that Grand Central Station would still be standing in, in New York City. Sometimes you need rules like this. And I think that if there are some people that are a little up, uh, either concerned or up, uptight about some of the rules that are in this here, I, I keep hearing about paint and stuff, those are things that should be able to be worked out. Um, and I look forward to you guys working that stuff out. But to, to put us out there on a hope that we're gonna have good people come in here and do the right thing for the, for the city of our heritage, what we have left of it, um, I think that is a really, I'm not gonna say roll of the dice, that is a real bad flip of the coin. Uh, and I can't strongly, again, say that we need to do something to save what we have now. Work your details out later. At least get the ball going on this thing. Because remember, none of us are gonna be here forever, but we want our heritage to be here forever. And all you gotta do is look up in Ward 1, where that nice house on Lakeside Avenue, we have no way to protect it. And no disrespect to the developer, but that's what he is. And he's gonna come in, He's going to tear it down any day, I guess. But that's coming down 
for what? And and um, it go the list can go on and on and on and on. So I strongly hope that you guys will give this the green light and you can work the stuff. You can go back and change things. You know that, that's definitely true. And I want to commend both Bree and, and Ruben with what they've done to their buildings, not their buildings, but their businesses, because they have kept the, in, the integrity of those buildings by building around the heritage of those buildings, what they have in there. But the wrong landlord could come along and, and change all of that, the, the wrong owner of the building without some sort of rules in, in place. So that's all. Thank you again very much. Thank for you, Charlie. Your time. <clears throat> Anyone online, Mr. Smith? No one's joined us, okay. Would you like a second opportunity to speak? One more thing. This is really to the business owners. Um, I speak very highly of our downtown business owners. I've called the paper numerous times. They should get their butts down there and do a story about the young entrepreneurs that are all over our downtown, as well as those um, family businesses that have been in place for so long. Um, I noticed that they work very well together. It seems that they have a nice collaborative um, um, friendship and, and they work to make downtown what it is becoming for sure. I would keep in mind that one of the things I think about often is uh, the Historic District Commission is also in place to assist those businesses from someone coming in, for example, if Mrs. McCarthy decided that she needed more signage or she needed a bigger something on the front of her storefront, and by putting something like that on there would hide New Leaf and those ladies' businesses, and it would de de uh, hide them or, or you know, distract people from being able to see New Leaf, Part of the Historic District Commission, just like the zoning, would say it's too big, it's too small, it's too whatever. It's to protect the businesses that are in place as well. We don't want somebody coming in and, and creating something outrageous on the front of um, somebody's building and then distracting from all those other businesses that are down there. Can you imagine big nine-foot neon sign outside of Mrs. McCarthy's on her corner there, that's really going to be quite the eyesore when you're trying to look for new leaf or you're trying to look or even see the colonial. You're not going to be able to see it. So those things are put in place to assist with all the businesses downtown, all the business owners. We're not here against you. We're here to, we're here to assist. Thank you, Tara. Come right up. So from a business owner's perspective, there are already things in place, as you well know, <laughs> to deal with signage. There is a signage ordinance. So the focus that Ms. Shore is uh, giving you is unrealistic. There are already things in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. Signage that is based on square footage of your business space, things that are not permissible in a certain zone things that are permissible. So it's actually redundant to have that historic overlay apply when that's already something that's covered. And as far as I have been explained, when it comes to the National Register of Historic Places, that is a voluntary thing where you have to submit to be part of it. You have to submit an application, it's very detailed, and you volunteer your property to submit to those restrictions on your facade, the things that will be historically preserved. So again, outside of the 11 buildings in downtown that are on the historic register that have already submitted themselves to that voluntarily, the historic overlay as presently written and their focus is redundant. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Um, I think, you know, to speak kind of to what, what Charlie was saying, 
Um, and I do love that that we can have this discussion. I have a lot of respect for Charlie um, and you know the things that he does for the community. Um, and so it's okay that we can disagree. We're still gonna be friends after and that's okay. Um, but um, it's, it's a, we're hoping to regulate behavior in a way to eliminate anyone doing anything that we don't agree with or that is harmful. And you, you, you're not gonna get there. You can implement these things and there are still gonna be landlords who, yeah, they don't demolish their building, but it's not doing the purpose that we all, the rest of us might agree with. So how, how do you regulate behavior? Like Bree was saying, there's, there's already things in place that we have decided in this zone, this is what we want. And if we wanna tweak those things, and that's one thing, but to add another layer, another commission, another group of people, I just, I don't think it's the way we get to. Tara, um, Charlie, Bree, myself, Melissa, we all agree with the end goal. The end goal is preservation. We participate in that and we want it. What we're disagreeing on is how to go about that. So anyway, thank you. Ruben, yeah. are you open for a question? Absolutely. Council Littman. Ruben, can you just, <clears throat> Ruben, can you share what the alternative approach would be in your perspective? Um, I guess it would be going through, I don't know if it's zoning. I mean, I hate to over-regulate, but I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure, but I don't look to the over-regulation as, as the solution for that. I mean, when you look at the things that are happening in Lakeport, right, you have, you have one gentleman who has preserved an incredible building, right? And then that same person has demolished a bunch of others that some people might have considered historic. You know, that's the issue is we, we disagree on some of these things. I have a lot of respect for the late um, Councillor Bolduc but he and I disagreed on the fire station. To me, it was a brick box. It wasn't anything unique about the architecture. I didn't know why we were putting all these regulations on someone to protect it. Now, the church is a different example because that is unique architecture. I understand the, the desire to, to preserve these, these pieces. But like M Melissa was saying is we're trying to, to, we have to have a balance of protection and allow innovation, allow someone to say, okay, this building is not going to work the way it sits right now and it's old and that's okay. Maybe sometimes that it doesn't work, you know, and other times we get to do what we did with the train station to say it doesn't work the way it used to. We don't have people riding the train, but now I have two restaurants in that space that wouldn't be there without us adapting it. So let's adapt. Let's, let's do that. But we have to, you know, I think give, the freedom to allow people that sometimes they're going to make the bad, bad decisions. And even as much as we may try to protect it, we might not be able to. Um, and in so protecting it, we're asking for a lot of unintended consequences. I mean, right now in Laconia, like the places that are thriving have, have good or decent landlords and the places that don't have good or decent landlords. Those are, those are the empty spots, you know? So I, you know, I, I take a little bit of offense to when people reference empty storefronts downtown because come talk to me about it. We, we're filling them, you know, and it doesn't happen overnight, but we are, we are progressing Laconia and we're doing it without these regulations. So what are, what are we trying to fix? We're trying to fix a problem for one specific building. We're trying to anticipate the future of what's going to happen with someone wanting to destroy a building. And what are, what are the other things, like Bree said, you, what are the other things you're missing? You know, when you have regulation like this, that's so open-ended, that's so subjective. Again, Charlie may say he wants his building that he owns to stay the same forever. And I may say, well, actually, if I had that, I would do this, this, and this. And those are different perspectives. And he gets to do what he wants because it's his building. So I, I just, I don't know that this regulation is, is the way to do it. And to answer your question, Councillor Littman, I, I don't know what the balance would be there. Um, I just don't think that this is this is it. Thank you, Ruben. <laughs> Mr. St. Clair, I'm going to limit you to one minute on this so we can move along. That's fine. Okay, that's Go. fine. 
I just want to remind everybody, it is not the inside businesses we're talking about here. We're talking about the protection of the building itself. And as a building owner right now in downtown Laconia, I would welcome this overlay because I think it would help me sell the building to somebody that's like-minded for what we want for the city of Laconia. How was that? Thank you. Thank you. Has anyone raised their hand online yet? We can't entice them, huh? Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for participating in the public hearing. I'd like to close the public hearing at 8, 10 p.m. Moving along to item number 13B, public hearing for resolution 2021-07 relative to the fiscal year 2021 year-end carry forwards. Notice of this public hearing was made available on June 16th, 2021. <clears throat> Edition of the Laconia Daily Sun and posted at Laconia City Hall, Laconia Public Library, Community Center, and the SAU. Action on this item may be taken up under unfinished business this evening. I'd like to open the public hearing and this matter at 8, 11 p.m. Anyone wishing to speak? Now would be the appropriate time. Any interest online, Mr. Smith? We're not selling this stuff hard enough sometimes, huh? We need to do something now. I'd like to close the public hearing at 8.12 p.m. Thank you. Under item 13C, which is public hearing for resolution 2021-14 relative to authorizing transfer of funds from the general fund to the internal service fund, notice of this public hearing was made available on June 16, 2021. The addition of the Laconia Daily Sun, posted at Laconia City Hall, Public Library, Community Center, and the SAU. Action on this item, like the previous ones, may be taken up under unfinished business this evening. I'd like to open the public hearing at 8.12 p.m. Now would be the appropriate time for anyone who would like to speak to the matter. Thank you. I'd like to close the public hearing at 8.13 p.m. on this item. Uh, moving right along to number 15, which is the mayor's report. I'll try to keep my remarks brief this evening. We've had a fair amount of work already ahead, uh, and we've got a fair amount of work ahead of us. Um, certainly, I want to um, chime in uh, with, with um, Charlie St. Clair. Um, I, I think all of us who had an opportunity to either visit um, Laconia Motorcycle Week rally, uh, whether it's Lakeside Avenue or around the city, I think this was um, in so many respects a banner year. Um, uh, it's a great bounce back year as we build momentum towards the 100th anniversary coming up in two years. So this 98th anniversary of the world's oldest motorcycle rally was a great success in no small part uh, because of the work of, of Laconia Police Department, certainly our DPW, um, our fire department, um, members of the city council, and certainly the staff here at City Hall. Um, and, and that, all of that work uh, certainly came together. Um, we really have to not forget that Jennifer Anderson and, and Charlie do an enormous amount of work uh, year round to get the city ready, to get their organization ready and and kudos to them. It was really great to see. It was great to be part of. It was great to be down on Lakeside Avenue on the last Saturday evening and um, see friends down there and see Councilor Hamill. Um, it, really, it's a lot to be proud of um, and a job well done. Uh, um, really more positive news. I had the opportunity to go to one of the our exciting businesses that have has landed here in the city, which is the Lakeport Opera House for a show on Saturday night. Um, it is uh, really an extraordinary venue, very intimate, um, a great area to socialize uh, before the show, 
the acoustics are are fantastic within the venue, and um, you know it's it, it's one of those renovation projects that is exciting to see come to life in our city and to see, I don't know, 200 people at the Opera House the other evening having a great time and socializing and creating a bit of a buzz. Um, you know, it's nice to see the city is so receptive to encouraging people like Scott Everett and Tim James Everett as they are um, really making a massive commitment to this city on so many fronts. And uh, I think it really bodes well for our city. So congratulations to, to them. Congratulations to the city. And I encourage everybody to get down there and, and take in a show and enjoy themselves. Um, uh, just one other item, uh, um, two other items, actually. Uh, today was the first day of Got Lunch Laconia, um, and it's really one of the extraordinary efforts in this community. It's one of those things that really ties this the people in this city together to go there with a group of people who have committed time and resources and their energies to deliver food um, to those folks who are, and kids, and adults who might be food insecure, nourishment insecure, people who perhaps rely on school lunches and uh, and breakfast. Um, the idea that this city would come together and make this type of effort, I think it was founded in 2010, so it's celebrating its 11th year. Uh, it's really a great privilege to be part of it, something, again, our whole community should be very proud of. Uh, the work that's done here. And um, it's one of the reasons that Laconia isn't just a city, it's truly a community uh, that cares about one another. So congratulations to the Got Lunch crew and um, I certainly look forward to being part of it uh, throughout the summer. Um, and not, not, not to finish on a, on a down note, but, but certainly, you know, I had an opportunity to spend some time with Stacy D'Amato's this weekend, and um, I know Stacy and, and Jose for quite some time. I know the the pride they take and the commitment they make to their their business in the Weirs. Um, they're great community members, um, and certainly hearing what occurred in, in, in Stacy's store you know, caused me some concern. I realized there might be different perspectives of what happened and I and I respect that. I have no doubt that, um, um, well, I, I will say this. Um, and, and, you know, I think the city has prioritized putting their Chamber of Commerce hat on and talking to businesses to, um, uh, so I, I, I don't, after talking with Scott and, and, and working on this a little bit, I don't think the intention was to inhibit business or to lay further obligations on people by any means. But I think we should always be looking for ways as a council and as a city um, to help people like the D'Amatos and other small businesses grow and give them the encouragement and the support that they deserve. And I think responsible business owners like they are and like we, so many of people are in this city, they respect where the city's coming from, that there are certain guardrails the city has put in place and, and they respect that and they're willing to work with the city. I would encourage us though um, to take a look at some of the ordinances that associated with our beaches. I realized last year was a, we were overrun with visitors and parking was a mess in so many of the city beaches and really sort of layered obligations on the city that perhaps we didn't anticipate. Um, but last year was in some respects an anomaly simply because there was a pandemic and, and it was just different types of behavior that we saw. But I hope in the coming weeks, we can address and talk about how do we encourage people to feel welcome at our beaches? I believe everyone sitting up here realizes that we are a and values that we are a tourist community and that people coming to visit our community is really important to us and it's important to our businesses. So I, I would hope perhaps we would have an opportunity to talk with um, folks at Park and Rec and the Park and Rec's commission to take a look at um, ha have we overregulated the beach and saying no cooking, no loud music. You know, I don't, I don't want anybody to think of the city of Laconia as somber town. You know, I, I, I think we are, um, I think we're I think we're more than that, and I want to make sure that we're striking the proper balance to responsible public policy and responsible government, but also respecting you know who do we want to 
when people look at this city from afar and think about coming to visit, do we want to say, do we want them to say, that city is great. I would love to go up there and spend some of my discretionary income and enjoy the lake and enjoy the sceneries. Um, you know, that's that's what I hope they're all doing. So um, it, I, I don't know what, we did talk about this earlier today, Scott, but may, maybe the next, um, love to have an opportunity to have further discussions. I think we can get creative where perhaps, I understand we don't want to have a, encumber the city with additional expenses because there's too many people cooking out and not enough uh, personal responsibility to pick up after themselves. On the other hand, um, what can we do to provide perhaps receptacles for coals, um, bags for folks who have trash and debris that maybe they will take personal responsibility and take it and put it in a dumpster or get it close to a bucket? You know, I think I, I would like to take a closer look at that. And, and certainly I'm not sure the why we don't allow floats and and uh, Weir's Beach and um, I realize again we have we're struggling with a workforce issue here in the city just like private places are, but but I'd like to maybe revisit this and and um, um, have some discussions about it going forward. Yeah, happy. So a little bit of background on that would be the the only regulation that was changed by the Parks Commission somewhere in this past year was limiting the cooking on beaches. And it's not just at Weir's Beach, it's at all the beaches. And that's come with ongoing problems of coals, of public safety, where people are dumping them, of seeing people rinse out dishes and food containers in the water where people are swimming. It's really a public health issue. The no smoking, no drinking, you know, no cigarettes, no vaping, um, loud music, that, that's all been in place. And I agree, loud music can be subjective, but I don't think any of our staff is going down there trying to be overly onerous on loud music airing on the side of caution. And I think, Mr. Mayor, you hit it on the head. We tried to go out and be proactive with some of the businesses and say, just as a heads up, you know, the city's going to be enforcing no alcohol this year. You know, we're going to be enforcing the no smoking. And there's really been an effort so that we can make it a family place, you know, not make it somber town, but make it a place that everybody can enjoy what's going on. Um, so that was the background, I believe, on why the Parks Commission um, made that approach. Anecdotally, I know staff have gone out and talked to a number of the businesses up and down the boardwalk, and I understand what may impact one may be a positive for others. And there's been positive feedback from some of the other businesses who are seeing more foot traffic of people coming and buying um, uh, lunch and, and snacks and that type of stuff. So um, we are we are doing the outreach, which I credit staff for going out and being proactive on that. The floats is really going to be a low priority for this year. I can't say, I, I believe it when someone said, hey, a staff member went down and said no floats. But really, since we're not, we don't have lifeguards on the beach, my understanding, and I'm not a, a trained lifeguard, but somebody having floats in a lifeguard area just causes issues with not being able to see a swimmer under a float type of thing. And also in some cases, it creates a false sense of security for someone that maybe they go out deeper than their comfort level because they've got a flotation device and it's not a life vest of some kind that's around them. So that's typically for when we have the lifeguard stations, we don't have enough staff this year to be, to be doing that. And my understanding is, um, that's going to be a, a, a low concern of, of doing anything with the floats. We, I believe we will still continue to look to do that at Bond Beach where we do have the lifeguards though. Um, okay. So it is truly the Parks Commission um, that does have regulatory oversight. I can read you uh, chapter 5-26 of our city code. It talks about parks and recreation commissions can be created under state RSA chapter 31 and by ordinance. The commission shall have the power to adopt rules of procedure and prescribe regulations for the conduct of all business within its jurisdiction. So that certainly falls to that. It may authorize the collection of admission fees. Um, as I shared with you earlier, Mr. Mayor, we used some federal dollars to acquire Weir's Beach back in the day. So um, for Weir's Beach, there is there would be no opportunity because part of accepting that grant um, prohibited the city from recharging an admission fee right to the beach. We can still charge for parking. Um, it shall establish, again, going back to the Parks Commission, shall establish the policy for the operation and improvement of the park and recreation system, and it shall perform any other related function. So it's a very small chapter, but the, the rules and regulations, certainly you could ask them to revisit, provide input, um, ask them to place it on a future agenda item, as a future agenda item, but that authority to regulate the operation of the parks does fall with the Parks Commission. Okay. Thank, 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 thanks very much, and um, I appreciate your work on that today. And um, uh, that would conclude the mayor's remarks. So I'd like to move to number sixteen right now, which are council remarks. And Councilor Cheney. 
not wanting to disappoint. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and Councilman, I've received two or three calls um, from uh, constituents who live in the Turnaway and uh, what's that other street up there? It's One of the others too. Turn away and Hilliard. There you go. Uh, and, and in any case, uh, areas up there where water has become a problem, apparently the wells uh, are not functioning as well. The ones that were put in by the contractor, they're on a community water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they've been asking the water department and me uh, to do something. Uh, I went to the water uh, commission meeting uh, last week with Councillor Susi. We talked with the water commission about it uh, with the director who has provided some uh, sort of off the cuff thoughts about what it might cost to get water up to the top uh, where, on Hilliard Road there, including a tank and pumps and obviously piping and everything else. He thought something on the order of $3 million would get it to the top of the hill. I'm not sure that would get it into those uh, streets. Um, but that brought up a bigger question, and, and I th think Councilor Susi would agree with me, and that is we talked with the commission about the last par portion of the city that has potential for significant residential growth is that north corner of the city, uh, the Parade Road, I'm sure there's other places, but that's a huge area which has a lot of growth potential. So at some point, um, I think the city's going to have to at least visit um, what we should do about that. One of the recommendations, as it happens, uh, was made by Wes Anderson, that we need to get a, a uh, professional consultant to look at this and give us some idea of what the future looks like. And I mean, right now it's two acre zoning with water and sewer, it would be one acre or less zoning. Mm -hmm. I think with water, it would be one acre with, I'm not sure with, with uh, septic, whether that would shorten it up. But in any case, he recommended to the Water Commission and I'm recommending not for decision tonight, but in the near future, uh, I, I'm recommending a discussion about finding a, a competent uh, expert to look at the north end of the city and give this council some idea of what short-term and long-term improvements might be, not only to to water, but I'm, I suspect to other utilities. I don't know what uh, the power companies have put up there, although in recent, the last year or so, they've made a, a an effort to in, increase the amount of power up there. Uh, but uh, there's not a lot of cable up there, <coughs> a lot of things. So uh, uh, at, at least as it relates to water and how we get it there and where we can get it to, um, right in the middle of all of that is a fairly large state park. How do we get around that? Um, because I think we'd need to cross some of it to, to provide water to Merritt Center Road. Uh, that's not going to happen when anybody at this table's still on the council, I suspect. But, but we ought to be at least thinking about it and, and, and starting the rudimentary planning uh, for expanding the water in the city of Laconia. The water department, and these are my observations, none of them said this, but the water department had that, uh, you know, the ratepayers will kill us, look on their face. Uh, and I understand that. Uh, and, and I think to expand, you know, the original water in the city was not financed by the water department. It was financed by the city to get it started. Um, and we came up with the, the system we have now. But I, I think the city, in order to grow, needs to participate to some degree in the planning and perhaps early stages of increasing infrastructure to that part of the city. Councilor Susi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Trini, you're right on. One more thing that we discussed at the Water Commission concerning this was that 
And I mentioned it to a um, planning director the other the other day when I saw him is that they're just starting the planning, the master plan for the city. And this is something that from the water water commission we wanted to see incorporated into the master plan is to look at all of that. We also instructed the uh, superintendent of the water department to look and see if you could find any grants or available funds in somewhere that fall within the water systems. Okay, there are things that are coming out hopefully through the infrastructure. See if there is monies available for either um, uh, consulting or being able to bring water from the weirs or something else up because and speak to some of the people up there that have called me from the water side. Okay. Yeah, the wells are drying right up. Yeah. And there was one other situation there where the developer is looking to develop 18 more lots. Okay. On the other side of that, and I mentioned to the planning director, how can we let those lots be developed if the water is not readily available? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the kind of things that we were discussing at the same time. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Go right ahead, Councilor. I'm sorry. This has nothing to do uh, with what we were just uh, talking about. After I finished at the meeting, and, and Bob was still in the meeting, uh, I, I went out through the office up on the hill. I've always thought of the water company of being down there on Union <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> I didn't. It's up on the hill. I, I knew there were tanks up there, but I didn't realize the facilities are up there. I would tell every one of you who haven't been up there to go up and take a look. There are five tanks that they purify the water in. Those five tanks develop 3 million gallons of water a day, purified water a day, in 12 hours. If they did it 24 hours a day, they'd make 6 million gallons of water. <clears throat> and they built the building. Right now, they drive trucks in and whatever, but they have built the building so they can put more tanks in there. And, and as a person who's been here 50 some odd years, I'm shocked at, at how forward thinking uh, that probably sounds worse than I intended to sound. I don't mean to suggest anything negative. I'm just, I didn't give it any thought. You really should go take a look. It's, uh, they've done a, an amazing job. Um, and, and they've put us, when we start talking, I asked this young man who, I think he told me he was in church. Well, I shouldn't say. <clears throat> Only because I don't remember. <clears throat> but he was of the opinion uh that, that the potential or the, or the ability to produce enough water exists now. Yeah. If they go to 24-hour shifts and if they expand the bays, uh, they can probably do a substantial, if we're only using, and by the way, in the winter months, we only use about 1.5 million gallons a day. He said optimum or, or mass use, large use in the summertime gets upwards of 2.5 to maybe a day like today, 3 million gallons. So we're not even using the 3 million we're potentially producing every day uh, now. And we have the ability to double that just by adding a second shift. So the ability to do some of these things and to have, as, as Wes suggested, an expert look at what we have, what we can do, and how much it would take to get it done I think is is critical, but I, I strongly recommend Bob can get you in. They got a gate they keep closed, but uh, gosh, go see it. I mean, next to the Colonial, it's not quite as fancy, but but it's worth seeing it. But really. it's a it's a remarkable operation oh, uh, I was there, surprised. and I, I was on the commission um, a couple of years ago, and I was struck that uh, how clean that water is that goes through there. And I, I took a walk down and took a tour and I bumped into a gentleman who was on his hands and knees with a, a rag and he was polishing the valves and he was all by himself. Yep. And I said, you know, what are you doing? And he very serious, you know, and I, 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 I was, I was really interested in, and he was saying, I got to, po we polish this. And, and the idea is if a public, someone from the public ever comes in here and sees something that looks a little dirty, how can they have confidence in the city water? So we, we look at the little things like this. And I thought that was so impressive that, that that's what he was doing out yep. there. And that ought to inspire all of us that, you know, and I, and now, and we know if we can 
flowage is what really is going to keep, you know, the water department solvent, right? Yep. Right. I mean, that's what it is with, um, and expand. I think it's a great idea, Councillor Chini. I guess that was my two cents. So thank you. Thanks for your service on the Water Commission too, Councillor Susie. It's a good group. Did you have something else you like that? No, the only thing is, is that when I take a look around, you take a look at the, around the state, the other cities. Yeah. Uh, and I talked to the superintendent. We're ranked basically number one in the state when it comes to water. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Production and all of, you know, everything else. Like that. You can read about the problems they're having down south. Okay. Yeah. And especially with groundwater. And we're right at, right at the top. We, it's, a, it's an asset or a gem that we forget to realize. I guess that's that's the most important thing. Good. Thank you. Any other council comments? Councilor Felch. So you to it. I'm a certified well operator, so I'm up there once in a while. <laughs> um, I also deal with DES, who regulates everything they do there. Um, they do a wonderful job. The facility's awesome. Uh, concur with both of you as well. Um, but besides that, um, on Saturday. I went to the Weirs to the beach and I walked the beach with Amy and Matt. Um, their staff was handing out pamphlets explaining the regulations. Um, we walked in an S, so we hit almost every area, almost every area of the beach. Um, no one seemed to have a problem with any of the problems. And as a matter of fact, we had more people compliment us on the rules that we that were set forth. Um, Amy and Matt do a great job. I know the commission put a lot of thought into this before they made these regulations. Um, so I definitely support them. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. In, in your observations, do uh, you think it's just that we need more uh, barrels or another dumpster or do we need Okay, I'm just. No, I think with the regulations we have, um, the the staff does a great job. There was, there was I think four of them there, three or four of them besides Matt and Amy. Of course, Amy met me there because I was going there. <clears throat> um, they take care of the trash regularly. Um, I thought we didn't have the staff. We have staff, we don't have lifeguards. Okay. So. And they, they do a great job so enforcing the, people, the regulations. Are the people policing themselves? Um, yep. And the police actually drove through twice while I was there in an hour's time. No, so. no, but the regular the, the people are going to the beach. Are they policing themselves? Are they are they picking up after themselves and that kind of stuff? Or or does the staff have to do that? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, and I know it wasn't as busy Saturday as it is some other days, like it will be this coming weekend. And I have been there before when it was real busy. And yeah, there's a lot of trash around. People leave a lot of stuff around. You know, the issue with um, hot coals on the ground, kids stepping in them, um, people washing their plates and their food out in the water. I mean, it, that you just can't do that. We have bacteria problems right. as it is. So, right. uh, you know, they they can bring sandwiches, they can bring coolers, they can do all that stuff, um, and they can go up on the boardwalk and buy things up there. So, I, I just have one more comment, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely. I've driven by there on the weekend early in the morning, six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's already a line. Yep. Okay, and a bus. Okay, Try from four o'clock on this coming weekend, they'll be yeah. there. For <laughs> okay, and, yeah. and it, we're talking about not city residents coming all over the place. Okay, and that you know, you, I just wonder, you know, I know we got a beautiful beach and a wonderful beach there. I just want to make sure that people are using it, take care of it. Yeah, and I think these rules help do that. You know, I think here. Yeah, go, go right ahead. You know, I think maybe one thing over that weekend that we might be able to do better is maybe uh, pick up the trash more often and get it out of there. Um, you know, the barrels and things like that. I could kind of do it more it's like a week, uh, add a little extra detail. Yeah, we, we've learned a lot on Fourth of July weekend over the years, but one of the things that staff also did today is they showed me the how full the dumpster was at the end of this weekend without the grilling there. And there's a lot less trash that's being generated with people coming in with 
um, either sandwiches or going up on the boardwalk and buying it. So the amount of trash that's in the dumpster has been greatly reduced. Um, so I think, you know, and again, like Tony, like Councillor Feld said, the staff, you know, is dedicated to it. We have staff there. It's just not lifeguards, but we have folks there. We had them there all last summer being the beach ambassadors and doing the counts and making sure everybody was safe. They're there this year to be proactive and make it a friendly place, friendly, user-friendly place for everybody. Um, and trying to find that balance. And again, the, the response I've heard has been overwhelmingly positive um, of some of these changes that people feel now that, you know, families feel the, they've, they've got their beach back a little bit now as opposed to um, having it overrun a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just fairly, very quickly, um, the um, Public Works Committee did meet for the second time and reviewed the facts and figures supplied to us by city manager and uh, Wes Anderson. Um, after looking at the figures, and uh, this is in regards to solid waste contract, um, facts and figures, um, we did ask the city manager because the town of Belmont's contract and our contract in 22, I believe, is that correct, Scott? Okay, coincide that the uh, city manager is going to initiate a conversation with the town of Belmont to see if we can have um, some kind of um, agreement with Casella and the town of Belmont in reference to use of solid waste, the trucks and pickups and contracts. So okay, we're moving forward. We're not there yet, but we're succeeding. Thank you, Councilor Hans. Councilor Ham. Yeah, just one more thing. Uh, last Thursday, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony uh, for the new uh, rail bike adventures uh, at the train station. And I uh, wanna thank uh, Ben Clark and family for bringing that attraction to Laconia. Like I said there, he could have brought that pretty much anywhere, uh, but he decided to invest in Laconia. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening uh, in our city. And I think that's just one more uh, that's added. So I hope you all get a chance to go for a ride sometime. <laughs> thank you. Uh, looks like a no, Councilor Cheney. I've got an all the pedaling I'm going to do. <laughs> if I might, add, if I might add, Mr. Little. Mayor, at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, all the cards were being used. No kidding. Oh, yes. Nice. Oh, that's, terrific. that's great. That's terrific. Awesome. All right. All right. Any other council comments? If I might, I just uh, yes. Go right ahead. I, I uh, to get back to the water issue for a moment. I forgot. It, 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 would it? be permissible to, to ask the manager to start the process of looking at what what the council would need to require of a, of a contractor to look at uh, the water needs and, and so on and so forth. I so think, a consultant to come in and yeah, do an analysis yeah. of the city. Um, uh, will you raise your hand? Yeah, I just, can we incorporate it in our master planning process? Absolutely. Yeah. I was talking yeah. that's, yep. right. that's fine. Yeah. The, right. the second that's thing I, I meant to, to mention and forgot was uh for 31 years i didn't go near the weirs during motorcycle <laughs> we're, we're not being we're not being heard out here by anybody tonight so please that get those microphones right in front of you you all wanted in-person meetings let's go uh I, uh I i didn't go near the place for 31 years uh, I, I i put 24 into it and I, that was a 25 into it and that was enough Somehow our police chief talked me into taking a ride. I ended up with my picture being taken with the police chief <laughs> and uh, Charlie St. Clair. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure some of my employees from the old days will be horrified to see that. But in any case, <laughs> while I was there, I had a, an opportunity to talk to a young police officer from the University of New Hampshire who was working on the detail there. He was driving a Segway. Uh -huh. that two-wheel. So I talked to him for like five or 10 minutes about the advantages of it or disadvantages, whatever. I said, in a crowd like this, isn't it? He said, this is the best thing in a crowd like this. A, because you're above them and you can see more. He said, B, if you need to get someplace quickly, this will get you there a, a lot more quickly. And a cruiser can't get there because it's just too big. Um, he made a comment that old people can appreciate. He said, and if you have to chase somebody, when you get to the far end, he's worn out and you're not. And that made all the sense in the world to me. 
in any case, I'd like to ask if the manager through the purchasing department could look into what it might cost to add one or two segues to, to the, uh, to the weirs detail, see how expensive it might be. Uh, and then we can make a decision once we know. Downtown also. What's that? Downtown. downtown. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think if we have them, we can use them both downtown and, and in the weirs and, and actually they probably could float between downtown and, and Lakeport. I think of the uh, the wild trail. What a perfect thing for the wild trail, you know, to cover a lot of ground. So okay. uh, I'd like to ask if he could. Please do. Be happy to get a price. Thank you. All right. Uh, that will conclude the council comments. Are there any committee reports that uh, members would like to share? Liaison reports. Going once, going twice. All right, well, item number 19, which is citizens request to comment on current agenda items. We have some agenda items. Does anyone like an opportunity to speak? Okay. Moving right along now and item number 20, it's our city manager's report. Turn it over to Scott Myers. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you've got two reports included in your agenda packet. I will try to be brief because I know we've still got a lot of work to do here tonight, and uh, I will try to be cognizant of that. Uh, it is the middle of construction season, so we are still working uh, um, over in the area of Lakeport and Clinton and Prospect. We're also in Lakeport on Franklin Street. The water department is done there now. We're in there now doing um, sewer and drainage, and then we'll be finishing up with the, uh, the paving and the sidewalk. We are out to bid and advertising for the Elm Street project. We expect to have that awarded somewhere toward the end of July with work starting first part of August. And we're cognizant of the fact that we're going to be working in the area of Elm Street School and getting that wrapped up before school opens um, later on in the August or September timeframe. So uh, that'll be a priority there. Um, we finalized dates that we think are going to be while still impactful, less impactful for the Court Street Bridge because that will be a complete closure. Uh, but because in the past we were trying to work around Pumpkin Fest and that's not occurring this year, we had planned on closing and doing the work between Labor Day and Columbus Day and having it open for Pumpkin Fest without Pumpkin Fest this year, we will be able to delay the full closure until post Columbus Day. So the Tuesday after Columbus Day is when we will be closing it down. Um, there will be work going on in advance of that, but it will be um, instead of the three lanes, including the turning lane, we'll be down to two lanes. So we'll have two way traffic at the overwhelming majority amount of the time, um, it'll just be lane shifts a little bit going on there, but the full closure will happen post Columbus Day. We've already been reaching out to um, businesses and impacted people down there. So those are the major updates on the projects. Uh, on the unemployment uh, report, you can see we're looking very solid. This report from the state is through April, but I know the main numbers came out as well recently, uh, and we're down in the you know the two and a half percent range um, for the state. And um, you know you don't have to look too far with the newspapers or on the reader boards all around Laconia and the region to see everybody is crying for help right now. So those who are looking to work certainly have the opportunity. Uh, the uptick in inflation uh, continued another spike this year uh, or this past month of May at 5%. So annualized year to date, we're one month short of halfway through the calendar year and we're running at 3% inflation. Uh, again, if you look back at the numbers in your report, um, you know, we've only shown 3% inflation three times out of the last 15 years. Um, but if you look at the past five, six, seven years, we have been significantly below that with really only two numbers at above 2% and most of them in the 1% range or even lower than that. So um, we think the economists are saying this blip is going to happen for a little bit, but they're not expecting uh, long term nor is the Fed. So we think this is a little spike that will um, balance itself out. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions the council may have. Councilor Hamill. Uh, yes, uh, Scott, um, I was looking over the uh, some of the budgets things in that there and I noticed there's uh, a couple of grievances that will be carried forward into the new budget. Do you expect, uh, could you explain those and do you expect any of those to have a cost effect on the budget? So that would have been from the report at the last meeting. So I don't have it in front of me. So I'm thinking the two grievances that we have right now, only one is really active and it's dealing with 
the fire union is challenging the interpretation of the language of the buyout um, for someone opting out of city health insurance. So a number of years ago, the council recall, we made it um, more attractive, if you will, in terms of greater dollars to have employees opt out of the city's insurance, providing that they could show insurability out elsewhere. So if you were under 26, now the law reads you could be on your parents' plan, um, you know, even though you're, you're 23, 24, 25. Um, if you could go on to a spouse's plan, you know, and show coverage. Um, but the, the caveat was that it was not another city plan. So in other words, if the city was going to provide buyout dollars, you wouldn't be staying on under a water department plan or a school plan or something else. You were truly not on city insurance. Um, so in this particular case, there's a firefighter who is seeking the opt out and the spouse of the firefighter works for the school department. And the, and the firefighter's argument is, well, that's not city insurance. And the city's position very clearly is that the school is a department of a city. Um, when you adopt your budget, you adopt one budget, the city is included, uh, the city, I'm sorry, the school, the, sorry, the school is included. Um, when you would approve contracts for the schools, they need to come to you for that authority. When the school needs to bond, they come to the city council for the authority. So even though there are some separation of powers and duties, the school is clearly, in my opinion, and in the city's opinion, a department of the city. And therefore, we should not be looking to have the taxpayers fund a two person plan or a family plan at the rate we do right now, and also provide cash incentive beyond there for not being on the city insurance because city taxpayers are still um, still paying for that. So that's, that's the key point right there on that one. The other one really deals with um, the calculation of um, leave time. And it goes back to when we were on 12 hour shifts and prior to, and I think there was one thing that was overlooked years ago, that time is accrued on a, on a firefighter shift. They'd work 12 hour shifts, but there's 10 and a half hours of actual work time there. The way the work week runs over a cycle um, is how we calculated leave time. Um, and, and that's just, uh, should, shouldn't have a cost. Um, where we to, so significant cost for this one case, um, no, um, but it, it, um, I feel we're, we're very solid. We are going to arbitration in August, but I, I never say anything is certain in the world of arbitration. So I will keep you posted um, after that hearing date and let you know. Thanks. Any other questions? Councilor Cheney. Yeah, I wanted to ask the manager, I've had some questions uh, or, or comments made to me with regards to uh, some expansion of permits for functions up in the weirs like October and that sort of thing, and uh, loudspeaker permits beyond 10 o'clock and that sort of thing, expanding to additional weekends. And I wondered if you could tell the council about that. Yeah, so I appreciate the question on that. So as we know, um, and I think very positively, some folks in the Weirs have tried to promote some different activities to either start the season a little bit earlier or extend it a little bit later. So we had Wake the Lake, which was kind of a block party Friday night through Sunday in a, in a small section on, um, on Lakeside um, from basically from Tower Street up to Foster Street. Um, and, and that's happened for a Put COVID aside, I think that's happened two or maybe three years now. There's a similar event, if you want to compare it to it, called Biketoberfest, which is slated to happen um, this year on the middle weekend in September, September 17th to 19th. Similar type of thing, Friday night to Sunday. Um, not a whole lot of impact, not a whole lot of major um, traffic detour. The, the Blues Festival, which happened in calendar year 2019, didn't happen last year because of COVID, is slated to be back on Weir's Beach, and that's received the approval from the Parks Commission, and that'll be going to special events. Um, but I did receive application, and the reason that they come to me is technically I sign off as the owner of the city property when it goes off to special events, so I see these. And we've got a couple of new ones that have come in, and one is for Weir's Toberfest, which is on the first weekend of October, which is referred to as a sidewalk block party in front of Tower Hill Tavern, Crazy Gringo, the big house, using city parking spaces for patrons. Maybe not a full road closure, but if you've got people spilling out into the parking spaces, you probably need more than a snow fence for protection. But that is something special events can, can figure out. And then there's another one in October called Wicked Weir's, which is called a Halloween block party. 
And that's the same layout as uh, Bike Timberfest and stage and food vendors in the street. And so I guess the, the direction I'm seeking is what's the view of the council? Because I don't want to paint you into in a corner of these go to special events and they come back all approved and we've got events going on. And as Councillor Cheney said, there's usually requests to go to the loudspeakers until 11 o'clock at night outdoors where typically they would stop at 10 o'clock on a Friday or a Saturday trying to balance the need as, um, as Fred, um, who, help me out, who owned a, the Proctor, how, the Proctor Cottages, Fred Clausen. Fred Clausen, thank you. As Fred used to say, you know, we balance, he sells sleep. We balance the needs of entertainment with sleep. So how, how, does, how does going multiple weekends of loudspeakers to 11 o'clock impact the sleep component or the people who think that summer is now quieting down a little bit and we're getting back to a little bit normal times and then more and more of these events are popping up that are on city street and i'm all in favor of the the logic behind trying to encourage but um you know it's using city street you know again not a lot of resources for this one um but just more the impact to neighbors abutters on now multiple weekends on what had been one in the spring one in the fall so just kind of before we got too far down this path, I'm seeking guidance for us and staff on what the thoughts are. Well, I I, I think, you know, we, we've got to craft a bit of a policy here. Um, again, going back to balance, um, I think it's terrific that um, people want to extend the season and have the initiative to, to try and uh, have these gatherings scheduled. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think we have to have a discussion about the use of city property and taking up the entire beach or a parking lot on a weekend that um, is towards the end, of the end of the season. But still, you know, what's the, what's the proper amount to charge somebody who's coming in, a private business coming in to use city property, shutting it down for, from the public for a period of time? Um, I, I think it needs to be discussed um, because I think we could be setting a bad precedent if we just send it off to special events it comes back all approved then i think we have a greater responsibility and, yeah. and i would like to get some direction from counselors here and, and just uh, just a special events will focus on things like safety porta potties lighting police detail trash they're not yeah. going to look at you know you rented out the whole beach for a blues festival in the middle of september and the beach went with it and the parking went with it and now we talked about the tourist season what about those folks who are coming up for the beach who have no idea and what does the city lose in not having people pay to park in those kiosk spaces? Because, um, you know, and again, it was this, in this case, it's for a for-profit versus a non-profit. So I think that comes into the conversation as well. So I didn't want to be the one kind of create, uh, you know, crafting policy on the fly and again, paint you into a corner, but thank you. It's, it's, it's also a cover my, you know, you know what a little bit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Councillor uh, Lippman, would this be, should this, should we take these applications and uh, put it into a committee, refer it to a committee for a further discussion on this? How would you suggest we might handle it? Yes. I think that makes sense, but I also think, so if we make a decision is to have the special events, review them without making a decision and with respect to yes or no, as to what the conditions are around them so we can look at it holistically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so and in, in, I think that's what we should be doing. I mean, out of the four of them that I mentioned, the Blues Festival or the three fests up on, on the area of Tower Street, you know, I, we've done the Blues Fest in the past before and we've done Bike Timber Fest. So I, 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 I think, I think to be fair to people putting this forward, because those events are coming up in September and we're already coming up on the 1st of July, that we should kind of move those along and maybe take some time to hold the other two back a little bit since they don't happen until October and maybe work this through the, the review that you're talking about. Yeah, and I guess the issue is to, you know, that time of year, does it have to go to past 10 o'clock at night in terms of the- Exactly. exactly. It'd be a little exactly. chilly out there yeah. that time of night, you know, <laughs> that time of year. Okay, I, I, I think I think that's wise. So the, the two that you can send off to special events, well, you send all four to special events, right? Yep. The we'll two that are back. that we've approved before which, which two are those again? I'm sorry. The Blues Festival and then Bike Timber Fest. Okay. And those I've are already done one. We, we, no, we've done Wake the Lake in May. Lake. Right. And we, we have done Bike Timber Fest in the past and we've done yeah. the Blues Festival in the past. The other two we in October we have not done. 
in the past. So I can move them along to special events with a caveat that they've still got to come back to the council for the temporary traffic orders. Um, but I would like the latitude to be able to revisit some of the expense on the Blues Festival where it is September 11th. It's still beach season, you know, Agreed. Le lease, leasing that beach for $500, which would be the going rate all day and losing the parking and losing the beach. And how do we accommodate other other users? I Agreed. would be something I'd like to work on as well. Council Evan, did you have something to say? Or Council Susie, go right ahead. Sorry. I'm just looking at it. come October. I mean, that's a very, very high tourist season for us. That. <laughs> there you go, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Um, he told me he was going to miss me earlier, so I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I look at October and I say to myself, that's a very, very high tourist area for us here. Okay. For not just the weirds, but it's the whole, you know, hotels, the, the whole population. And it's a different, uh, I think a different type of tourist that might come in. I'm just not sure what, and we heard from the rest of the weirds community. That's what I want to see. That's for later. You're talking about the the, the late October, October. right? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, took me from the first of October to yeah, you season's know. a little over by that point. But I, nonetheless, I'd have yeah, no problem with them weighing in on this, and right. and you know, perhaps uh, Tony, you can, and and you as well, Councillor, um, reach out yeah. to some folks there to get a little input, collect some intelligence. <laughs> yeah. like, that's yeah. exactly. that's right. Very good. Yeah, I talk to people in the wares a lot. Um, I know Anthony, I know um, Ryan, I know a lot of the people that own the businesses up there. Um, everybody I talk to is in favor of what they do. Um, as far as that one area, Anthony owns most of those businesses along that stretch of the road anyhow. Um, and all the other businesses that are there all agree that it's a great thing. He's bringing in business. As far as October, if you go through the weirs in October, I don't care what week, <laughs> you, there's plenty of parking, believe me. Um, the one on the beach, I think because we... One on the beach in September 11 is probably the one that concerns me. That, that's that would be just the on only the one. I mean, I, I, I like it. I brought a lot of people in. Um, Not enough money. And I... I would say maybe the issue is how much we charge, but September 11th is a lot slower time of year. You can go up to the weirs and find plenty of places to park. I mean, not as slow as October, but. Okay. So, and, and I can speak to you. Yeah, you should, uh, if you wouldn't, continue to cl collect some intelligence yeah, on this and I so will. we can have, make an informed decision. And sure. I, I know I, <clears throat> I've taken calls from the outside the businesses, from the residents there. So I think. We do look at some things. I think we should talk about hours um, and make and also make sure we're not blocking the mount from having its end of the year business too. And in, in, in any of these, if you ended it, and in, in what Council Libran was saying, you know, an hour early at ten o'clock um, on the outside, they've still got the ability to go inside, and, and the inside entertainment license runs till twelve thirty or one o'clock. So I mean, it's not like the party needs to end everybody goes home at 10 there's still an opportunity to go inside the buildings and continue with entertainment as well so and maybe that's what we need to right. do so once just, in October. but, but, I, so, but yeah. I think again the residents who aren't necessarily there who i think kind of some of them as we've heard from put up with the noise and motorcycle week and put up with something there and they probably maybe look at it this is a little bit quieter time and is it just an ongoing loudspeaker type of thing weekend after weekend i just wanted to get some input and I know you're going to get different responses from different people. Uh, my cousin owns uh, three houses, actually, on what's the street across from the Wooden Bridge that goes up back? Foster, oh, Foster that's Street. Yeah. Um, he's all for it. He loves it. He sits on his front porch and listens to the music all night long. <laughs> Maybe so his great. neighbor hates it. He owns three of them. So. <laughs> Muse, uh, these applications for music and dancing? Um. A couple of them are new, so so one of them is to put a haunted house out there. But again, I don't know if that includes loudspeaker or band. They're they're not the most complete applications that I've seen coming in. So um, I'm okay. just reading into them a little bit. But all right, let's. I want that to go to government operations or public safety? Yes, probably government operations. Hmm. Fantastic, Thank Councilor you. Susie, you are the chair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Loudspeed. All right. Um, Move on to new business. 9.04 p.m. We're just diving into new business. All right. 
under 21A, which is the first reading of resolution 2021-15 relative to authorizing the city manager to accept and expand a grant on behalf of the city in the amount of $162,764. from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, Boating Infrastructure Grant Funding for Laconia Municipal Docks and request to schedule a public hearing on July 12th, 2021 during the regular city council meeting. Uh, I think the council will remember, I think Scott sent us an email some time ago. This is the big grant uh, for the dock work and municipal docks at the Weirs. So be a series of uh, three motions to move this along. Looking for a motion to waive the reading of the resolution in its entirety and to read by title only. So made by Councillor Cheney, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing all none, all those in favor? Raise your hand at six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Second, I'm looking for um, to move a first reading of resolution 2021-15 relative to authorizing the city manager to accept and expend and sign all any and all documents for a grant on behalf of the city, the amount of 162 $1,764 for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Boating Infrastructure Grant Funding for Laconia Municipal Docks. So made by Councillor Haynes, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Six votes in the affirmative, that motion passes. Third and finally, looking to move to schedule a public hearing on July the 12th, 2021, during the regular city council meeting to gather public input prior to any action being taken. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Yeah. Councillor. Um, just one question, Scott. Uh, on, on the resolution itself, it has the uh, grant funding in the amount of the 162, 764, but I know the city also has a matching uh, contribution to that. Should that be in the resolution? I, I, I see it back here, but does it just says 25%. It doesn't give a figure. Should um, that figure be in the resolution? It doesn't need to be. I mean, the 25% match, and you can do the math, is basically it's about 60 something thousand dollars. Um, that was based on estimates, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. Um, that was done probably about a year ago at this time, and we all know what's happened to um, lumber and building material and stuff. And I'm hoping that maybe that will have peaked and come down to drop when we go to construct next spring. But um, the federal part was capped at a firm dollar amount and we maximized what we could there. So the remainder of which is going to be 25% give or take is the local share. So I don't think that number needs to be there because your vote is to accept um, this, this particular grant. That's what you're voting on. The rest of it will be coming out of city dollars that you'll be approving elsewhere. And that's capped at about $40,000, right? Out of $160,000 grant. Is that correct? No, said? I think we're about 60 something thousand because the, I think, I think the project was, I think it was a $200,000 max and we're a little bit over that. So. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. At. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Yep. All right. Any further discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, the, all those in favor indicate by raising your hand, six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. Moving on to item number 21B, which is city manager contract extension discussion. Section two of the city manager's employment agreement provides that it be extended at the end of each contract year so that there is always a full year's contract in place in the event the manager or council decide not to renew. At this time, the council should consider extending the city manager's employment <laughs> agreement until June 30th, 2023. This report was coincidentally submitted by Scott Myers, the city manager. What would you expect me to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Just funny. Okay. Uh, so we'll be looking for a motion to move to extend the contract of city manager Scott Myers as outlined in section two of his employment agreement until June 30th, 2023. So made by <laughs> so made by Councillor Susie. Oh, yes. <laughs> Seconded Same by Councillor Haynes. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hands. That's six votes in the affirmative. <laughs> that motion passes. Thank you, Scott. Congratulations. And Thank you. Great to have you on board. <laughs> This is a request uh, to unseal non-public minutes from December 29th, 2020, January 4th, 2021, January 25th, 2021, February 8th, 2021, February 22nd, 2021, March 8th, 2021, March 22nd, 2021. 
Uh, this is, I'll be looking for a motion to move to approve the early unsealing of non-public meeting minutes ahead of their scheduled time for all of those dates that I just read to you. So Wait. made by Councillor Cheney. Seconded by Councillor Felch. Further discussion, Councillor Susan? I just wonder what was the reason behind yeah. it. There, a request was made. Um, a citizen asked me and so I put it forward. And the business is done. Yeah, these are all so, finished things. Yeah. So these were all dealing with 30 Church Street or 50 Church Street negotiations. And I think all but one had a six month unsealing date anyway. So the first one would be, oh, actually be unsealed today automatically. And the rest of them were probably going to be like, you know, July, August, September until the six months were up type of thing. But I think to Councilor Felch's point, um, the the transaction is closed on one and we've got a signed purchase and seal agreement that we've already discussed publicly with the other. And if they weren't coming out today, they'd be out within a few months and staff has reviewed them and there's no issue. I had sent them all to you in an email attachment saying that they were still confidential until you as a body took a vote, but there's there's no reason in staff's um, purview or review that they should not be unsealed. I just wanted to know why. Yep. Any further discussion? All those in favor of this motion, please indicate by raising your hands. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Like Item number 21D, which is a request to amend the intermunicipal agreement for joint representation with cable television franchise renewal negotiations with Atlantic Broadband LLC to add the town of Northfield to the consortium of municipalities. Scott, can you just touch on that just a bit? Yes, you already approved Laconia being part of the working group, which helps us defray our legal expense in working on our franchise renewal. Um, Northfield has come to the party late and wants to join, and therefore the attorney feels that everybody needs to re-vote to accept or a majority need to approve and reflect it in our minutes to keep the attorney general's office uh, in a good position on reviewing the intermunicipal agreement. So even though... I rolled my eyes and said, are you kidding me? I probably said more than that, but it needs to come before you. <laughs> that that's another cost another couple shared. billable hours. Yeah, there. we have one more one more team player to help share the hours. So that's why we're, right. we're doing Some it. Will... <laughs> Second, Councillor Felch. Uh, any further discussion on this and, issue? Councillor Libman, yours was to the exact language that was presented there. That's your motion, yes. Madam Clerk. Thank, thank you. you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you, Council. Moving along to unfinished business here, which is the second reading of Ordinance 2021-235-21.2, relative to amending City Code Chapter 235 zoning to update 21.2, the historic overlay district. Um, this was uh, obviously something we addressed, we had for public hearing earlier this evening, and this is what we'll be taking up right now. Councillor Lippman, I see. Uh, as I had foreshadowed at the last council meeting, I think we should uh, vote this version down. I think that um, from the public testimony, um, both for and against, there's some work to be done to, to strike the right balance. Um, I think, um, you know, laissez-faire um, of, of nothing is probably not the right position whether the geographic spread is as far as we want it to to go um, I think those are all things and I'd propose that uh, the quickest way to to actually move forward is to vote it down tonight um, and make sure that a couple of the projects that are in motion don't get delayed and so that's that'd be my motion to the my fellow councilors. <laughs> So is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Council Cheney. Is there further discussion? Councilor Haynes? Yes. Um, may I ask Council? He's question? open to a question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so vote this down, but then revisit it. Absolutely. I think we knew, we, we, we as a policy, as, as uh, uh, one of the speakers talked about, was we as a voted to create a district. Right. Um, I think there's, as I said, there's a, there's an appropriate balance to be st struck here. I think the fact that um, there's been of the issues that I've been involved in the council, I've heard more on on this issue and the concern of balance. Um, and uh, I think um, it's not 
adopt it and educate it. I think it's, we need to work together, work through it to make it work for the, the community at large. I think just saying let's adopt it and having such um, opposition to it is not the, the way to proceed. I think big things that we've done in the city, we've, we've typically done by moving together as at large, not necessarily unanimously, but at large. And this one, I feel like is, is divisive. And um, I think we can do a, a, a better job in, in uh, striking a balance here. And I think that's, if you really listen to the testimony, it's no one was, ag no one was against preservation and our cultural past. It was how we went about it. So may I ask you, so are you saying that we should, this should go to a subcommittee? I think, um, or the entire council, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that, that's all right. I mean, to my to my feeling, this is this is a really big, important issue in terms of how we deal with it and the strong opinions. I think working as a, a committee of the whole on this okay. is the appropriate way to go. Councilor Susie. One of the comments I heard someone make, and I'm not sure exactly who it was, was that when this was up in front of the planning board, and this is like that more discussion with Dean, that the people who were for it were the ones that were going to be empowered to manage it. And the people that were voting against were, you know, speaking against it were the like the business owners. Yeah. And we're gonna get as you said, gonna get that balance. And that, that bothered my that was the biggest thing that bothered me. I mean, I think that again, as a council, we said we wanted to create um, something like that we've created. I guess the issue is is the policy of preservation is I think globally if purpose statement we want preservation i guess it's it's really the procedures that are behind it the detail that people yeah, we'll are, are having a hard time um, swallowing and maybe some of it is because people just don't understand it and some of it may because it really needs to be tweaked um and you know i think um we want to make sure that in the short run that investment that's we knows and and, and track and seems to be in the right way not to not to make uncertainty around those investments, but to, there's not a there's a burning platform here, but it's 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 a slow burn, not a fast right. burn. So. I don't I don't anticipate unanimity throughout the city, but I do anticipate that we'll build a consensus uh, on both sides of the issue that makes good sense going forward. And, and, and I, I think that's, that's that's I mean I don't want. Um, the members of the commission to think that we don't think that works yeah. in value. I think we just need to calibrate it some to make it fit so that it can work for the entire population. With clarity. Yeah. Councilor Cheney. I think this council has demonstrated its uh, desire to see historic buildings preserved. Um, uh, but, but I think to, to, uh, amplify or, or something uh, uh, Councilman Lippman's comments I was at the planning board when this was voted on it was not a unanimous vote mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, for some of the very same reasons and in fact uh, the chairman's comment at the time was this is the council's decision to make not ours so let's pass it on to the council. I'm going to have a discussion with him over coffee sometime. <laughs> but, but I think it is incumbent upon us to, to look at the details. I, I don't think we can, I don't think we can go forward without knowing, without knowing uh, what we're approving in detail for, for this commission to, to do. I, and if I can just, uh, Tony, forgive me. I've been in government a long time. And, uh, you know, some of us have been around uh, government for a long time. It, it doesn't take much for these things to get off track if, if, the, if the rules aren't delineated carefully. Um, and, and I've watched it time and time again. I don't think with ill intent, uh, you know, I, I had to put a parking lot in on a property of mine 30 years ago, and the city told me I needed 12 foot wide parking spaces because that was a city ordinance. 
Nobody makes a 12 foot wide car, hasn't <laughs> made one that big in 50 years, but the ordinance said, and nobody paid attention to the detail. So, uh, you know, I just, I want to support Henry 100% that we need to look at this carefully. Councilor Felch. So, so yeah, I mean, one of, one of the problems I see is reading through it, as was said by a couple people, the wording is very vague. Um, the power that the commission get has the way the wording is set up is way beyond what it should be. Um, you look at the building on Main Street that was just painted. That would be a historical building. The way the wording is in that, they could have told them they couldn't paint it. And look how great that building looks right now. Um, also, if they're going to do a district, I'd like to see them come forward and tell us which buildings they feel are historic and why not just because of age or because of sentimental value, why are they historic? So the motion is on the table and we do have a second. Um, so any further discussion, go right ahead. Yeah. Hamill. Um, you know, I think uh, pretty much everybody is like what Henry said, uh, wants to save historic buildings, but like what Tony said also is why are they historic? You know, and I think that's important. Um, I think there are buildings uh, that we have right next door to us that would fit very well. I think this council, along with the historical commission, work very well with the properties that are in a historic district. So it's not like we're not willing to work uh, with people. But um, to the very next step to lop in the entire downtown uh, in one whack. Uh, and, and kind of say that everything's historic and we have such a good momentum uh, downtown right now. I'd hate to see that stymied. Uh, I don't know if this would do that, but um, I think it might question, uh, people might have questions of whether they want to buy a building where there's layer after layer after layer of uh, things that they have to s sign on to. So I, I agree, I think we need to relook at everything, uh, but do I think there's historic buildings? I absolutely do. And there's some great ones that we need to preserve, but I think there's, there'll be a way to get there. And I think we can work on that as a council and as a commission to be able to do that. Thank you, Councilor uh, Hamill. Councilor Lippman, did you have anything you wanna no, say? I, I just would add to what Bob is saying is that I think this council shown a strong commitment to to preservation and that make no mistake we're as a council i think tonight voting this down is not that we're against preservation in any way we're for it we just need to do it sensibly so that it doesn't tear the community apart and create another set of problems it may not be ready for prime time at this moment is what i hear you saying i think it's it all depends on your perspective and i think the perspective is it needs a little bit more balance built into it so that it works for a much bigger part of the community. If there's no further discussion, we can call the question if you like. All those in favor of the motion that's on the table, please indicate by raising your hand. Opposed? Five to one, that motion passes. So in terms of um, uh, moving, moving forward, um, I guess maybe the mayor and the city manager and the planning director might want to talk about how to advance the we will. moving forward yeah. part. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Moving right along to item number 22B on your agenda. Yes. We want to be recognized on this one too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Which is the second reading of resolution 2021-07 relative to the fiscal year 2021 year and carry forwards. Um, so from oops, go right ahead. Yes, perfect timing. So from um, the discussion last um, meeting, we were talking about certain things that the council would that aren't necessarily budgeted, but see along the way during a year that could um, improve the appearance of the city, um, and it could be different spots at different mm -hmm. times. We, you know, we've had a non-capital reserve fund which has worked very well for unplanned repairs and, and some things that we've seen that we need to take 
take care of. I would propose that um, based on um, the status of the contingency and the manager can speak to that in the current year that um, I think we've we've got a, a good healthy balance in the contingency. We could take $20,000 from that carry forward to establish um, a, um, a fund to be um, um, for the purpose of, of city appearance improvement, a city appearance improvement fund in which we would, as we see things come up, whether it be Christmas lights or, or flags or different odds and ends that we don't necessarily have to anticipate and get to that fine detail that we have a little discretion during the year that the manager doesn't have to go look for it and that we also put ourselves to a budget in terms of how much we're going to spend. So um, is that a motion on the table that we would vote on or so how, how would we? I can read in a, a motion. I'd move to amend resolution 2021-07 to include an additional carry forward of 20,000 from the administration contingency, contingency account for the purpose of city appearance improvement. I'll second that. Further discussion. Scott, do you have any uh, words for this? No, I think that's a great amendment. And uh, I think these are for maybe smaller purchase items that don't quite rise to the level of a non-capital reserve, um, which is usually a threshold of a higher dollar amount, but it gives us a ready place to go for uh, unforeseen things that will, will go a long way, I think, for the city. So I'm pleased that we'll have this money there. I think it's an excellent idea, Councilor Lippman. Um, so I think we can start there and, and, you know, as we have, there are sometimes opportunities for one-time money that you know we could potentially add to that fund over time, like we've done with the. I think we started the non-capital reserve fund with fifty thousand. Tay, it starts at, it sits at like two seventy-five, I think, or somewhere around. Yeah, there. there's some projects in the works though that we'll be spending that down relatively quickly. <laughs> but <laughs> at the moment, it looks good. <laughs> uh, but that yeah. being said, we we built it up. Absolutely. By yes. you know just using some prudent prudency in terms of how we spent yep. the money. So Scott, my question to you is: This is a standalone motion on the table right now, ready to be voted on. How does this? Is this not an amendment? So I think if you, you would amend resolution 2021-07 as presented by Council Libman, you've already got a second, so that'll be your vote. And then you'll go up and you'll go through your three motions, waive the reading, move the second reading, and then on the third reading, you'll move to approve resolution 07 as amended. So a motion on the table to be voted on now. There's been a second. We've had the discussion. We're ready to call the vote if there's no further discussion. And this vote is strictly on the 20,000 adding to what was presented. Correct. Yes. All those in favor indicate by raising your hand. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you. Okay. So as we move along to the other three motions in front of you right now, looking to move to a motion to waive the reading of this resolution in its entirety to read by title only. So made by Councillor Cheney, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. And second uh, motion is uh, looking to move a second reading of resolution 2021-07 relative to the fiscal year 2021 year end carry forwards. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Cheney. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. That's six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. The third and final motion we're here is to move to approve resolution 2021-07 as amended relative to the fiscal year 2021 year end carry forwards. So made by Councillor Lippman, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. That's six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Thank you. Thanks again, Councillor Lippman. I think that's an excellent idea. Item number 22C, which is the second reading of resolution 2021-14 relative to authorizing transfer of funds from the general fund to the internal service fund in the amount of $950,000 with funding to be to provided from the general fund balance. Make that motion. What's that again? You make, make that, that motion? motion yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's, 
let's move along. First of all, the motion is going to waive the reading of this resolution in its entirety and read by title only. Uh, so made by Councilor Lippman, seconded by Councilor Susi. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hands. And six votes in the affirmative. Motion passes. Second motion is to move a second reading of resolution 2021-14 relative to authorizing transfer of the funds from the general fund to the internal service fund in the amount of $950,000 with funding to be provided from the general fund balance. So made by Councilor Lippman, seconded by Councilor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. And finally, move. Uh, looking for a motion to move to approve resolution 2021. 14 relative to authorizing transfer of funds from the general fund to the internal service fund in the amount of $950,000 with funding to be provided from the general fund balance. So made by Councillor Lippman, seconded by Councillor Haynes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask, no, we won't ask the clerk to call the roll. <laughs> Just raise your hands. <laughs> Six votes in the affirmative. That motion passes. Under number 22D, which is the rest request to approve a tentative agreement between the City of Laconia and the Laconia Police Officers Association for the period from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. City Council, we've all been briefed on the terms of the tentative agreement prior to this evening's meeting. So right now I'll be looking for a motion to move the City Council to approve the tentative agreement between the City and the police, uh, Laconia Police Officers Association for said period. So made by Councillor Felch, seconded by Councillor Hamill. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. That's six votes in the affirmative and that motion passes. I'd like to adjourn the city council meeting for 